prayer connects us to the Almighty God. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Prayer gives power, faith, and hope into the hands of the one who can move mountains. From the beginning of time, we have been looking up to a sky filled with mysteries among the stars. But the greatest mystery that has ever been revealed is that the maker of the universe would die to hear us forever. When we pray, we are talking to the God who loves us and desires the best for us. You are not talking to a void. You are talking to a boundless person who loves you more than eternity can reveal. Sokel is a camp of open dialogue between God and his people as we learn of his way through the scriptures in every moment of our day. Sokel Camp Meeting has become a timeless tradition of faith intersecting with culture, pleasure bursting with praise, and truth uniting with tradition. It is camp meeting time once again. We invite you to join us as we worship our Creator together and let our prayer rise with the beauty of grace moving the soul. David Asherick currently pastors the Kingscliff Seventh-day Adventist Church in Chindera, New South Wales, Australia. He is the former pastor of the Troy Seventh-day Adventist Church in Troy, Michigan. Additionally, he is the co-founder of Arise, a discipleship and training ministry which merged with Lightbearers. He has been featured on 3ABN and Hope Channel and has been a regular presenter at the annual Generation of Youth for Christ conferences. A former punk rocker, David became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian at the age of 23 and went on to become a pastor. He is the author of God in Pain. Please welcome David Asherick. All right, good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Wednesday. It's Wednesday, right? I almost said Thursday. But as you know, I'm on Australian time. I heard somebody say it. That's right. I'll tell you a funny thing that happened to me one time. I'm very conscientious about, I don't, I don't fly on the Sabbath. I try to minimize my travel on the Sabbath. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really committed to that, really conscientious about it. And um, <laughs> this is a funny story. I left... Auckland, New Zealand. So I had a speaking appointment in Auckland, New Zealand. And um, I was speaking at a youth event. This was probably eight years ago, seven years ago. Speaking at a big youth event. And then I got on a plane. Now this is important. After the Sabbath. So it was like the sun set at, I don't know, nine o'clock or something. And they had a late flight out of Auckland. Uh, I think we went Auckland, Sydney, Sydney, LA. And uh, so we left at probably 10 o'clock at night. And uh, so it was well after the Sabbath, and it was great. Everything was fine. And, and I don't know why I hadn't thought this through, but we landed. Uh, it wasn't L.A., it was San Francisco. I landed in San Francisco um, Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. <laughs> and I was starving. I was like, it's Saturday morning. I should be in church right now. But I was just in church all day yesterday. And so I was just like... It, I just had this really kind of funny idea that, you know, just imagine that all of those stewardesses and all of them, you know, you know, they're keeping the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath, you know, because the Sabbath is passed. And then we cross the international date line and they're breaking the Sabbath, breaking the Sabbath, breaking the Sabbath, breaking. <laughs> so anyway, the, the international date line is a funny, funny thing. I don't know if you followed at all that massive controversy that took place in the South Pacific Division with the movement of the international dateline around American Samoa. Did you follow this at all? Fascinating. And uh, I have a lot, of course, a lot of uh, Samoan friends and people from that area who are, have family in Australia. And that was, that was a big deal, but it's kind of messy because if you've ever looked at the international dateline, have you noticed this? It swings way over around the Aleutian Islands and then back this way. It's not like you, you think in your mind it's a straight line. Go look it up. Google it sometime. Look at the international dateline. It moves horizontally hundreds of miles, right? So it's like keeping the Sabbath, breaking the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath, breaking the Sabbath. So anyway, I was sympathetic to those people in Samoa whose parents had made strong stands for the Sabbath on this day and for generations. And then the government says, hey, we're going to switch to another day. And then the people who'd been keeping that day forever, they said, we're not going to do it anymore. We're going to stay with the new day. But the funny thing was, this is a tremendous irony, and it's kind of funny if it wasn't so sad. The people that said, no, we're absolutely committed to keeping the Sabbath, the original Sabbath, were now actually worshiping on the new day that was Sunday. So it was just 
a big mess. So the International Dateline, it's a round planet. It's a little weird. If you've ever traveled to the far north, right, where the sun shines for like three straight months and then disappears for like three straight months in places like Norway and Alaska, right, it's like that's a very long Sabbath, right? <laughs> All right, great to be with you here this morning. Let's start with a quick prayer. I know that Gary prayed a beautiful prayer just before he came out, but I'm really looking forward to today's mes meeting message, and I uh, just want to start with a prayer. Father in heaven, great to be here this morning. Bless our time together, and may we better understand how to communicate your heart of love, your heart of grace and of forgiveness and of salvation to a world that in many cases, sadly, Lord, doesn't want to hear it. Or at least they think they don't want to hear it. So help us to find creative and intelligent and biblical ways to get access to people so that your spirit can get access to them in new ways. Father, we know that your spirit has access to every person speaking through nature, speaking through beauty, speaking through the inner voice of truth. But Father, we want to get access to people with love and with service and with scripture and with this great portrait of who you are in the Bible. And so, Father, give us wisdom today as we talk about some of those stories and learn how to put legs on our lessons and feet on our faith. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen, amen and amen. It's a little cold, isn't it? I like it. I like it. My favorite temperature in the whole world is like 50 degrees. Who thinks that's way too cold? <laughs> You're all from California. Anybody agree with me out there? You just like it? You like it? That's me. I like it when you have to wear a sweater to be comfortable, right? But I'm from Wyoming, right? I was born in Wyoming, so I'm a little weird. I freely admit that. Um, let's just uh, put up the slide that we ended with yesterday. We're talking about bridges, not walls, how to speak to anyone about Jesus. And today we're going to go through as many of these stories as we can make time for. We'll talk about Ben. I'll talk to you about my uh, strategy in speaking to Jehovah's Witnesses. I'll tell you a story, a really great story of a, a lovely lady named Saperna, uh, a story of a guy named Kifa Muhammad, um, a young man named Joel, another young man named Brendan, and then Kate, the Pentecostal minister. Before we get into those individual stories, and I sort of model for you or give you instances, sometimes success stories, and I'll tell you a few sort of how I did things really wrong. And uh, I'll just press pause on that. Years ago, I, I took a, a seminar that I traveled around and, and gave in quite a few places. And the seminar was basically how similar to this, how to witness, how to be evangelistically intentional, etc. And part of that was I went through the 10 most common mistakes made by Christians in trying to communicate the gospel to other people, the 10 most common mistakes. Now, I'm not going to go through all 10 of those, but I'm going to tell you what the first mistake was. And I think it still holds true. I've seen it over and over again. And the most common mistake that's made by Christian people, followers of Jesus, who want to try and communicate their faith effectively to others is, are you ready for it? They don't make enough mistakes. Now, why do you think I might say that? That the most common mistake is that they're not making enough mistakes. Because they're not doing it enough to learn how to do it right, right? Because I use the illustration of learning to ride a, a unicycle, right? right? Learning to ride a bicycle is a comparatively easy task. Probably all of us in this room can ride a bicycle. Is there anybody in this room that can ride a unicycle? Like if we had one right here, you could ride it around this place? Any unicycle riders? Okay. Now, first of all, I think we can all admit that the sort of design of a unicycle is a bad one. Can we just say that it's a terrible design, right? But it does look kind of fun, and uh, I've seen people ride unicycles, and it actually looks sort of interesting. In fact, several years ago at Arise, we had a, a young lady that brought a unicycle to Arise, and she left it sort of outside, and she said, hey, if anybody wants to try this, give it a go. Well, I consider myself a reasonably fit, reasonably athletic person, so I thought, well, I'm going to learn how to ride this thing. It, no, I'm not going to learn how to ride that thing. I, I tried it and I went, you know, dangerously fast forward and I tried it again and I went dangerously fast backward and then finally I got two strong fellows on either side of me and tried to awkwardly pedal the thing forward and I went back to the girl who's just like, she just, you know, she can do whatever she wants on the thing. It looks so almost graceful and easy and I get on the thing and I think I could never ride this. 
And uh, she said something very similar to me. She said, if you're going to want to ride a unicycle, you have to get on it hundreds and maybe thousands of times. And this is key. So your body starts learning all of the little things that are wrong. And then just by a process of deduction, when you figured out all the ways to not do it, one time your body will say, hey, this is how you do it. And that's what happens with a lot of Christians in their witnessing to other people. They tried it once and it went really poorly. They tried it a second time and it went really poorly. And they said, I'll never learn to ride this thing. Right? They just gave up. And so a big part of learning to be an effective communicator of the gospel, whether a public situation like I'm in now or in a, in a private personal situation, is you're just going to have to make lots of mistakes. You're not going to hit a home run every time. You're not even going to get on base every time. You're going to make some really bad mistakes. You're going to say some things you wish you hadn't said. And once you learn through a series of making bad choices and saying the wrong thing and saying it in the wrong order and getting too argumentative or whatever your particular mistake might have been, you'll start to learn better how to do it right. Are, does that make sense? And so today I'll tell you some things that I've done pretty well, but this is after years of just learning how to interact with people in the name of Jesus. And I'll tell you a few stories, maybe a couple, um, where I just made some mistakes. I just said some things that actually closed down the conversation. Now, before we get into that, I want to walk you through what, what is a, sort of a rubric that I've come up with. It's a formula that I've come up with that frankly has been a game changer for me and uh, this is only the third time, maybe fourth, third or fourth time that I've presented this publicly. And I'm actually looking forward to writing a book about this at some point. Um, so I'm going to share this with you and hopefully you'll find this interesting. It's what I call the X to 10 fallacy. And uh, the X to 10 fallacy looks something like this. You have kind of a continuum and you can just imagine that from 1 to 10, you could use any number, of course, any spectrum of numbers, but we're going to use 1 to 10 here. And on the far left end, the 1, that's going to be people who are not just religiously disinterested, but religiously hostile. And on the far right end, a 10 is going to be um, whatever we consider the finish line to be. So in the case of most Seventh-day Adventist evangelists and evangelism, we think of a 10 as somebody becoming a baptized member of a local Seventh-day Adventist church, okay? Now we could change the 10 slightly. We could say um, a committed follower of Jesus. We could say a Christian, whatever. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But just think a 1 is religiously hostile, a 10 is committed religiously committed, committed to Jesus Christ. Okay, so far so good. And then every, at every stage along the continuum, you have sort of different levels of interest in uh, biblical Christianity. So, so a, a two would be maybe not hostile to religion, but totally indifferent. Completely indifferent, atheistic, no interest, thank you, but no thank you. Where a one is antagonistic, angry, upset, mad. Okay, then you get to maybe like a three, and a three would be like an agnostic who uh, doesn't think that Jesus was really anybody special. Maybe he was an historical figure, but yeah, no thank you, not interested. Okay, now you get to something like a four, and a four might be somebody who's not themselves, they wouldn't identify as religious, they would probably identify as an agnostic, but they're open to the idea that there might be something out there, some sort of a God figure, some sort of meaning or purpose in the universe. By the time you get to five, midway on the spectrum, this is somebody that, in, in my sort of creation of this idea, this rubric, is open to the idea that there is a force in the universe. They're even potentially open to the idea that that might be something resembling the Christian God, but they wouldn't identify as a Christian. These are the kinds of people that you might meet that would say, I'm spiritual, or I believe there's a purpose in the universe. You hear people talk this way. They'll say things like, the universe had something good in store for me. Have you ever heard that before? So they sense there's a purpose. They sense there's a sort of teleology to events a providence, a kind of providence, but they wouldn't identify as a Christian and they don't regularly attend, they don't attend church at all. Then you start to move toward the other end of the spectrum as we're getting closer to committed follower of Jesus and attend, and you have somebody that's a six. Maybe this person was raised in a Christian home, a Baptist home, a Nazarene home, uh, uh, a Seventh-day Adventist home, and they no longer practice Christianity, but they're sympathetic to Christianity. They might know some of the biblical stories. If you pressed them really hard, they'd say, yeah, I, I do believe there's a God and it's probably the Christian God, but I'm non-committal. 
right? We all, I think, know, probably uh, many of us in this room know people like that. A seven is just more of that, right? Maybe the person that's a seven would be even open to attending church, uh, maybe on Christmas or Easter or something like that. Um, open to religious things, maybe even occasionally um, opens the Bible. Um, eight, more interested still. Nine, on the cusp of becoming a follower of Jesus. Ten is the finish line. Now, you can also plug in different religious affiliations there. So if you take like a Muslim, a Muslim, of course, is a committed monotheist, right? They believe in one God, and they also believe in uh, large portions of the Old Testament. They would, of course, deny the divinity of Jesus, but somewhere on that continuum, they would be maybe something like a six or a seven, a committed Muslim. They're monotheistic. They believe there is a God, but they're not sympathetic to the teachings of Christianity. If you took somebody that was maybe like a, a conservative Hindu, they would be maybe closer to a four or a three on the spectrum, maybe a five, depending on sort of their flavor of Hinduism. They're quite removed from the Christian end of the spectrum, but they are theistic, right? So you, you can just imagine everybody that you know would fit somewhere on this sort of imaginary spectrum of completely hostile to the Christian faith all the way to, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 to crossing the finish line and becoming a committed follower of Jesus. So far, so good, everyone? So I would imagine that most of us in this room here today are, are tens, right? Or there might be a few nines in here, a few eights, I suppose. Maybe there's somebody that got drugged here by their girlfriend or their boyfriend and you're like, uh, I'm a four, that kind of a person. Okay, now the people that attend our churches are basically nines and tens, right? The people that regularly attend our churches are people who are either committed followers of Jesus or who are on the verge of coming committed follower of Jesus, or they're in a prenuptial arrangement with somebody that they marry. It's, okay, I'll go with you to church, I promise, right? I've got a few of those in my church. And uh, they're there under compulsion, right? Captive audience. Um, what I want to talk about, the X to 10 fallacy looks like this. The idea of the fallacy is that when we think of gospel success, uh, think of somebody sitting in a conference office, you know, a Ramiro Cano or a conference secretary, when they, when they sit down to evaluate, by the way, I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this, I'm just saying this is the way it is. When they sit down to evaluate a church's success or even a conference's success, they have very limited metrics to do this, right? Like a church's health would be evaluated by certain metrics, right? And the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit of metrics would be things like baptisms, right? Like how many baptisms did your church have this last year? right? And the idea is, is that the more baptisms you had, the healthier your church is. That's not always true, but that's the idea, right? So if you had a church, you had zero baptisms last year, it's like, hey, that's not a good sign. And a, a conference secretary or a conference ministerial director or a conference president can sit in a room and read a piece of paper that has a printout of all the churches, the number of baptisms. You can also have other metrics like attendance, you know, how many people? Oh, 220, then the next month was 219, you know, then the next month was, you can look at, you know, your average attendance. That's a metric. It's a helpful metric, but, but it doesn't really measure a lot when you think about the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in the world. Are you with me? I'm not saying these metrics are unimportant. There are, they're, they're meaningful. The number of baptisms in a local church or a local conference is a meaningful metric. The attendance in a local church is a meaningful metric. You, you with me? Tithe is a meaningful metric, but in terms of giving us a window into the, the work that the Holy Spirit is doing, as, as we've said in our Jonah series in the evening, that God is working with everyone everywhere. Amen? Okay, so here's my point. We can't really easily measure what we might call gospel success or moving people along that continuum until they cross some kind of a threshold. Either A, regularly attending church, check, or getting baptized, check. But there are lots of victories and successes along the way in ministering to people. And we can fall into a trap of thinking that if we've not got somebody across some kind of imaginary finish line, that we've failed. We've, we're not doing it right. We've, we've made a mistake. And that's what I call the X to 10 fallacy. Just imagine that you have a neighbor. Okay, you've got a neighbor, and maybe 
you've li lived next door to this person for 10 years, okay? And you, you're, you've got a great relationship with them. You know the names of their children. Um, you invite them over to your house, you know, annually, maybe for the 4th of July, um, you know, vegetarian barbecue. And um, you've maybe watched the Super Bowl together. You know one another's names. At uh, one time, your weed eater wasn't working, so you needed to borrow their weed eater. And you, you've got a relationship with them. They're not your close friends, but you've got a good relationship with them. They're your neighbors. And let's say that over the course of your 10-year tenure living next door to your neighbors, um, when you first met them and they found out you were a Christian or a Seventh-day Adventist, they were really standoffish. You know, they were like, ah, that's not really my thing. And you sensed that there was some hostility there or at least some indifference. And, you, you know, if you were sort of imagining where they were on that spectrum, they were like a four. Okay, they're not interested. That's not my thing. I'm not a church-going person. Wasn't raised that way. They're respectful of the fact that you go to church. Now, this is just an imaginary situation. But over the course of your 10 years together, some really interesting things have happened. One of them was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, at one point, you were talking to them about it. They began to cry. And then you, in a moment of bravery, said, uh, you know, Margaret, I know that you're not a really religious person, but could I pray for you? And, and Margaret said, yes, would you please pray for me? Because she was afraid. She had breast cancer and she let you pray for her. And then on another occasion, because you'd prayed with her, she let you know that, hey, I, I just want to let you know that uh, our grandson has recently, you know, had a terrible uh, motorcycle accident and he's had a spinal injury and he might be paralyzed. Can you please pray for my grandson? Okay, now this is key. Over the course of your 10-year association with your neighbors, they never have become yet baptized members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They maybe have never even come to your church. Not only are they not members, they've never come, but they have been so favorably and positively impressed by your commitment to Jesus and by your Seventh-day Adventism that they have moved along that continuum from being hostile or maybe even antagonistic toward faith, maybe a four, and now there's something closer to a six where they're actually open to the idea that there might be a God and if they were ever going to go to a church, it would be your church. You, 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 you with me on this, this sort, of, this sort of scenario here? Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question. Is that a meaningful movement along the continuum of that person's life toward becoming a follower of Jesus? Yes. Yeah, so, so could we call that success? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We can easily call it success because you can just think of the reverse, right? Imagine that you had neighbors that you met them as like a four and you were such a cantankerous, obnoxious, forthcoming, overbearing person, and these people do exist. Um, that they, at the end of your tenure of being their, their neighbors, they said, I'll tell you what, I would never be one of those people. And now they're like a three, right? So that would be, uh, that would be tr moving the wrong direction. That's not progress, that's regress, okay? So, so the idea here is basically this. You could never measure that at a conference office, right? There's no form that Pastor Cano can sit down and say, wow, my church members in the, in the Central California Conference are being effective neighbors to their, to their neighbors and, and co colleagues to their co-workers. And are, are you with me? Yes or no? Okay, so now I'm going to go to the next slide here, if you would, Steve. I'm going to beep that. So here's what I'm saying. A 10 crossing the finish line and becoming a committed follower of Jesus, a baptized member, is the most measurable, but it's not the only meaningful metric of gospel success. If in your interaction with anybody, a brother-in-law, a neighbor, a colleague, a co-worker, a child, if they move along the continuum from a two to a three, or a four to a five, or a six to a seven, in other words, if they have been favorably impressed about God and about Jesus by your witness and your words, you have to consider that as a giant victory. Because it's very rare, actually, for just one person or one family to take somebody from what we might call zero to ten. It's always not always. It's often lots of people, different situations. Oh, my, my brother-in-law became a Seventh-day Adventist, and now I learn you're a Seventh-day Adventist. Or my sister became a follower of Jesus, and now I learn that you're a follower of Jesus. It, you know, to use the sort of modern parlance, it takes a village. 
And so it, you might have only brought somebody from totally hostile to open, but then you pass the baton to somebody who comes into their life and they go the next level and they go the next level and they, and they go the next level. And you may, maybe they move away, they move to Massachusetts and you don't keep in touch with them. You send Christmas cards, but you're not really keeping in touch. You may never know that at some point in the future, they cross the threshold. Are, are you with me? And so we don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that we've only had evangelistic or gospel success if somebody becomes a baptized member of our local church. No, 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 no. Gospel success is any progress along the continuum. And so the X to 10 fallacy is the idea that unless we have moved somebody from a 4 to a 10 or a 6 to a 10 or an 8 to a 10, we have failed. That's not true. That is absolutely not true. We must learn as a church, both a local, a local and a global church, to better understand and appreciate, what, what two words did I leave up there? Gospel success. Now, I'm actually pretty passionate about this, and I can have a tendency to get a little fired up, and I'm going to try to resist that temptation. But as I said yesterday, just briefly, I've been giving a lot of thought to this idea about what is the primary calling of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I am roundly persuaded that if given a choice between we are called primarily to say something or we are called primarily to build something, I think we have something to say to the world. In other words, I would say it this way. I think our, I think our posture toward the world, our, our evangelistic modality to the world should be proclamational, not institutional. I think we should just be like, hey, we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to sow our seed all over the place. We're going to do, you know, random acts of benevolence and goodness and kindness. And we're going to do it unashamedly in the name of Jesus. And hey, if you want to come along and join our tribe and be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we're happy for that as well. But we're here because we want the whole world, insofar as it's possible, to get exposure to Jesus Christ and His saving love. Okay, and I think when we, when we just turn a little switch in our mind, I can tell you as somebody who's preached dozens of evangelistic meetings, when you just make the switch away from institutional to proclamational, it really, it, you just can shake off a lot of denominational anxiety that you feel about, man, I've got to get this person to become a Seventh-day Adventist. But I'm going to tell you something, and I hope I'm not the first person to tell you this. There's going to be a lot of people who become followers of Jesus and who are eternally saved who never become members of our specific denomination. Amen. Right? And that's not because they're not good people and it's not because they're not faithful people. There's lots of reasons. People are multidimensional and situations are nu nuanced and complex. I'll tell you one of the reasons, and I, I hate, I hate, it pains me that I have to say what I'm going to say right now. But one of the reasons that some people will not become Seventh-day Adventists is because their local church is such a poor representation of the gospel that they find it easier to be followers of Jesus and take Scripture seriously at their local Baptist church or, or Nazarene church or Wesleyan church than at their local Adventist church. I have had couples that have said to me, I could, I could tell you stories, I've preached on a couple of these in the past, where people have said, we love light bearers, we love your preaching, we use the truth link study guides, we love the Adventist message, but we went to a local Adventist church and they were unkind, unfriendly, unaccepting, and all they wanted to talk about was dairy products and jewelry. And so we went to the local Baptist church and these people love Jesus, and so we see ourselves there as Adventists, not denominationally affiliated, but as far as, far as the message goes, they're my people. So one of the reasons, and I'm sad to report this, that some people will never cross that threshold is the local church in their area, at least at this point in time, is falling well short of the gospel standard. Are you with me? Okay. So let me tell you some stories about, let, let's, put some, let's put some real tangible stories on this, as I've been saying, story time with Uncle David. We must learn to trust Jesus with the less measurable metrics of gospel success. Amen? Now, I just want to say one word here because I do not want to be misunderstood. My least favorite part of the human experience, well, I have two least favorite parts of the human experience. Well, maybe three. Dying, which I've never had that experience yet, so I'm not worried about it. Throwing up, 
Does anybody else out there just hate throwing up? I mean, I will do anything to resist throwing up. So number one, throwing up. Number two, dying. And, and number three, being misunderstood. I, I hate being misunderstood. And I want to be very clear on what I'm not saying here and what I am saying. You are looking right now at somebody who is an absolutely committed member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church who is deeply passionate about the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's what you're looking at. There is no, there is no secret agenda here. There is no subterfuge to try and undermine the teachings of the... Not at all, but there is a, an increasing awareness as somebody who's a convert to this strange tribe and as somebody who is aware that the church is not going to do what we think we're going to do if we continue to do things the way we're doing it, right? And so I think we just have to at some point pause and say, hey, wait a minute, we need to keep doing what we're doing. We need to perfect, do, you know, we need to get better and better at it. And then we're just going to have to be large hearted and big minded and say, God is going to have to do something Pentecostal and supernatural to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So I don't want you to read into anything I'm saying here, but I am going to be a little firm on our evangelistic strategies and our metrics of success because we have created such a narrow funnel that we've effectively said, unless you become a baptized member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a denomination, we have failed, and I don't think that's true. I think we can have a proclamational model rather than an institutional model, and I believe this is actually the DNA of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I think when the Joseph Bates and the James Whites and the Ellen Whites and the J. N. Andrews set out, they were not like, we're going to create a worldwide denomination and we're going to have lots of buildings. I think they were like, we have to tell the world something really important. That's what I mean by a proclamational model. By the way, I got no problem with having buildings. That's fine. We need buildings. They're, they're convenient, right? But we're not mainly here to build buildings. We're here to preach the gospel. Okay. With all of that having been said, let me tell you some stories. So where I, where I pastor uh, is on the east coast of Australia. Australia is, as you know, uh, an, an island continent. It's not technically an island, but it's called an island continent. And um, most of the people live on the coast, right? If you've ever been to inland Australia, there is nothing there. And by nothing, I mean nothing. It's just, it's, it's, it makes Wyoming look like a teeming metropolis, okay? There's just nothing out there. So everybody lives on the coast. And where I live on the coast, I live uh, about midway down the coast, just about an hour and a half south of a place called Brisbane on what's called the Gold Coast, if you've ever traveled in that area. I've been pastoring there for almost the last six years, about five and a half years. And um, Australia is a very secular country, only about 25 million people in a nation that's the size of the United States of America, right? So it's the size of the U.S. without Alaska. So it's a huge country, but only about, I think, maybe two-thirds of the number of people that live in the whole of California, right? So it's a sparsely populated country. Many people would regard it as paradisical. I would be, I agree. It's very, it's very awesome. It's like paradise. It's incredible. Now, having said that, there's lots of things there that want to kill you. Um, not really the locals, not really the people, but spiders want to kill you and snakes want to kill you and crocodiles want to kill you and jellyfish want to kill you and sharks want to kill you. So it's a really great place to go and die. Um, but basically nobody's walking around with a gun, so you don't get a lot of shootings, right? But you do get, you know, shark attacks. So it's a very secular country, and while many Australians, a similar number of per percentage-wise of people that identify as roughly Christian, it's, it's like within five or seven percentage points of the United States, but church attendance is much lower, much, much lower. Okay, so it's just a more secular country. So... Where I live, we have the Adventist church, and there's a few churches along the coast, and there's quite a large Baptist church that runs a school called Hillcrest. And Hillcrest is a, a, a big, beautiful, um, award-winning, uh, very uh, prestigious, I shouldn't say very prestigious, a, a, quite a prestigious, um, academically renowned school that's private and is Christian, okay? So I think they have like 2,000 students, great school, and I have two of my church members that teach at this school, Baptist school, called Hillcrest. And uh, one of them is a real go-getter, man. She's like, bam, 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 bam. She just, what she wants, she gets. Her name is Carolyn. 
And shortly after my arrival in Australia, Karen was like, look, I teach at this school. It's a Baptist school. You've got to come. You've got to meet Ben. He's absolutely amazing. You're going to love him. He's the chaplain. You've got to speak to our students. I, so she, what, she's like badgering me. It sounds mean, but she's like continually agitating with me. And at her school, she's continually agitating with the chaplain of the school named Ben. Oh, we've got this amazing pastor. You've got to meet him. He's from America. He does such a great job. He speaks really fast. The kids are going to love him. And so she's talking to me and she's talking to him. And then finally, you know, she just is one of those that just wears you down. And then she gets what she wants, right? She's really amazing. She's actually an incredible human being. Um, so one day I get a phone call from Ben and Ben's like, hey, my name's Ben. I'm the chaplain here at Hillcrest. And um, Carolyn's been talking to me and I'm like, yeah, mate, I know she's been talking to me too. We have a laugh and he says, hey, listen, we'd really love to get you in. Now, Carolyn wants me to come in and speak to the student body, to come in and do one of the chapels for the student body. But, you know, Ben's no dummy, right? He's not going to, he never said this to me, but he's not going to just trust me, some known name, Seventh-day Adventist you know, pastor, you're not going to, you know, release me on his student body, not going to do that. So he said, hey, I'd love to have you come in and do a staff worship. Smart, smart, you know, bring me in, you know, kick the tires, you know, have a smell and see, you know, how I go. So I go, I say, yeah, I'd love to come in. We arrange a date and I go in and they say, hey, you've got, you know, 15 minutes to talk to the staff. So there's like 60 teachers. I see these people as in many ways, my coworkers in the gospel work. Because we're in a hugely secular country. They are trying to make an impact for Christian education in my local area. So they're not Seventh-day Adventists, but in my view, these are my people, right? These are my people there. These are committed followers of Jesus, many of whom are Baptists. You've got a couple Seventh-day Adventists in there and Wesleyans and Presbyterians. A, a, a mix of Christian people that are trying to make an impact for Christian education in a very secular nation. Are these our people? Yeah, these are my people. So I go in there and they're all, you know, getting their lesson plans ready for the day, you know, scarcely paying attention. They have these staff worships, I think twice a week, drinking their coffee, getting ready. And I went in there and I was given 15 minutes and I gave the most amazing Bible study on the mark of the beast. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Of course I didn't do that. No, no. I went in there and I gave a 15 minute talk about the lessons that I learned in how to follow Jesus from skateboarding. And I brought in my skateboard and I did a skateboard demonstration and I talked to them about how the lessons that I'd learned in skateboarding had transferred really amazingly well into my becoming a follower of Jesus. And when it was done, the people, they were wrapped with attention, you know, their attention was just wrapped. And when they were done, when I was done, they all applauded. And Ben, the chaplain, came up and said, ah, I got to tell you something. That never happens. He said, these guys are busy. They're thinking about their lesson plans. I have never seen, first of all, they scarcely pay attention when I speak, he says. He said, I've never seen them clap. That was incredible. He said, look, I've just had an opening come open three weeks from now for another staff worship. He's not stupid. He's not going to, you know, maybe I just, you know, maybe I got lucky. They say uh, even a blind dog will find a bone every now and then. So he's... He's going to give me a second go. So he gives me a second chance. Says, hey, three weeks from now, could you come in and do another staff worship? And I went in for my second staff worship and I did another talk that was just a general talk on how I became a follower of Jesus. And I talked about the nature of moving people along a continuum. And once again, the, the, the local staff there, they clapped. And Ben was just like, mate, when can you come and speak to our young people? And so we set it up. And I went in and spoke to the older students and then the younger students. And then it went swimmingly well. They had me back a second time and I did another chapel. They then asked me if I could come in and help teach a Bible class, which I was happy to do. And now what's developing is a relationship. A relationship. And, and Ben and I are getting along really well. And I'm meeting, you know, students and staff. And so when I walk in, because I have several of my families that have kids there as well. I've got uh, probably three or four of my church members that went to the school. Um, so I see my own kids there. You know, there's, as I said, a couple thousand students, a big school. I think it's a couple thousand, maybe it's 1,500. So after we've sort of developed this relationship between Ben and I, after maybe a year of me going intermittently to Hillcrest, he, he pulls me aside. He says, hey, David, can, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, man. He said, you notice when you come and I introduce you, I don't make a big deal about the fact that you're a Seventh-day Adventist. I just say you're a local pastor. 
And I'm like, yeah, I'm cool with that. We're good. And he said, but bro, I got to be honest with you. He's a young guy. He says, I love the way you teach. And I love the way that you're communicating the gospel. And the kids are paying attention. And, but can I, can, I, can, I, can I level with you? Can, can I talk to you on the reel here? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, knock stuff out. And he said, I did a little research on this whole Seventh-day Adventist thing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, what, what's up? And he's like, well, he said, a lot of what you guys believe, I believe. But he said, can, can I ask you a, like a really pointed question? And I said, yeah. And he said, what's with this whole when you die, you don't go to heaven thing? He said, that's the hope of the gospel that we have in Jesus, that when we die, we, we go to heaven. I'm, I don't understand that. Now, if this had been even 10 years ago, when Ben asked me that question, I would have been like, Ben, I am so glad that you asked that. <laughs> Just so glad. I've been waiting. I would have given a, you know, five-minute, rapid-fire, comprehensive Bible study on what happens when you die. But I want to share with you the words that came out of my mouth. It was this right here, what's on the screen. I said, Ben, what you and I believe is experientially identical. And I said, for example, let me ask you this question, Ben. If, if heaven forbid, something were to happen to me tonight on the way home, and I were to die in a car accident, in your view, in your theological view of what Scripture teaches, what do you think would be the next thing I would know? And he said, you would see Jesus in glory. And I said, that's what I believe. And that's what I believe. My next conscious thought would be Jesus in glory. So what have I done there? I've built a bridge. I followed it up by saying, now just to be clear, there is a difference between what we believe I just believe that you believe that it happens immediately, and I believe that there's an intervening period that the Bible calls asleep, but experientially, the person that dies is not aware of that sleep-like state, and so the next thing they know is Jesus in glory, and this is why Jesus said, when I come back, there'll be a resurrection, and you'll be with me in paradise. I've gone to prepare a place for you. You know what he says? That makes a lot of sense. Are you with me? Okay, so what I've done there is I've maintained credibility, I've spoken his language, and I've tried to... Com I didn't, did I in any way compromise what I believe? No. no, but I didn't make it unnecessarily combative or argumentative. I did not in any way deny the truth of what I believe, but I, I gave it, I gave it a, a, a framing that gave him access and kept the relationship. So do you think I still get invitations to go there? Of course I do. Now, Ben has moved on and he's studying, I think, counseling right now. And they've got a new chaplain and I'm just getting to know him. But the point is the relationship is there. Okay? Sometimes I find myself speaking to people like Ben who are familiar with basic Christianity, but they don't know much about Seventh-day Adventists. And so one of my go-to things that I like to say to people is, look, if, if I can just sense that they don't know really what a Seventh-day Adventist is, because they're like, you guys, the one's in Utah, right? And I'm like, no, that's not us. The, m multiple wives, that's you? I'm like, no, one's enough. <laughs> Here's what I say. I say to them, listen, I'm a Methodist that goes to church on Saturday. Right? What am I doing when I say that? I'm building a bridge of commonality. Hey, I'm not terribly weird. I'm actually kind of normal, right? I'm just a Methodist, but I go to church, and I'll sometimes say, I'm a Methodist that goes to church on the biblical Sabbath. You with me? I'm building a bridge. I'm communicating in a way that allows me to maximize similarity with those who love Jesus and who take Scripture seriously as God's Word. Take that and, and put that in your bank. Deposit that into your intellectual and methodological bank because you can use that for the rest of your life. When you find somebody else who's a follower of Jesus, figure out how to maximize similarity because these people love Jesus and they take Scripture seriously. So don't maximize the differences. The religious walls that exist between you and people of other denominations or other faiths are already there. The walls are already there. It doesn't take any particular creativity or ingenuity to build a wall with somebody that sees things differently than you. The walls already exist. Don't pat yourself on the back if you're able to build another wall. No, any sucker can build a wall, right? 
figure out how to turn those walls into opportunities and into bridges. Learn how to maximize similarity. Now, let me tell you a story, a very different kind of story. I'll tell you quickly a story about how to relate, relate to Jehovah's Witnesses. So we do a big Christmas program in our church every year, and we invite the community to come. And I've got some, I've got some amazing, amazing church members. And one of my local church members that I'm just really near and dear to my heart, they all are, but one that's just a real firebrand of a woman, her name is Mel. And Mel's like, I've got this great idea. And she always has great ideas. I've got this great idea. What we're going to do is, for our Christmas program, we're going to go walk around on the beach, because we live right near the beach. We're going to go walk around on the beach. We're going to bring a camera crew, and we're going to interview people and ask them what Christmas means to them, and you know, what's their favorite thing about Christmas, and what gift are they hoping to get. And then we're going to edit that all together, and we're going to put it into our Christmas program, and then we'll invite those people that we've interviewed to come to our church. I'm like, great. Knock yourself out. She's like, and you're going to come with me. I'm like, all right. Uh, fine. I'm, I got no problem. I'll walk around, ask some questions. And so I show up early one morning because people are out on the beach walking early in the morning. Um, beautiful little beach there at King's Cliff. And she says, um, as I show up and as soon as I see her, I'm like, I knew it. She's got these like giant elf ears on her head with like, like it's got like flashing Christmas lights. And she's holding a Santa Claus hat that's like six feet long. And I know who's going to wear that Santa Claus hat. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. I am no fan of Christmas. I'm not a Christmas guy. We, I, by the way, I don't care if you are, but I don't do the Christmas thing. I don't do the Santa Claus thing. I don't do the Christmas tree thing. I just, it's just not a part of sort of the furniture of my life. So I look at that Santa Claus hat and I, I'm like over my dead body. Okay, I'm not wearing that thing. And so I tell her that. And, but Mel, she's Serbian, and, or she's Croatian, excuse me. And she's like, yeah, you're going to wear the hat. I'm like, no, I'm not. So it's like a test of wills. So I don't wear the hat. And um, we go wandering around. We got our little camera crew. And we're going up to people and saying, hey, we'd like to just interview you about Christmas. You know, giving our little spiel. And people are like, nah. You know, like one in three are like, sure, sure. She's like, look, we've gotten like five no's and only two yeses. Put the hat on put the hat on. I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding. So I slide this ridiculous thing on my head, walking around mad as can be. And sure enough, <laughs> sure enough, now we, we ask 10 people and nine are like, yeah, for sure. What do you want to know? I'm like, man, this works. This hat works great. <laughs> Little kids are coming up to us and are like, can I, can I be on your television program? Okay, whatever. <laughs> you know, Paul said to the weak is weak, to the strong is strong, to those is with the Torah. Okay, whatever put this silly hat on my head and I'm happy to talk to people. So we're walking down the street and I, where we live, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses set up these little signs and they like sell their little watch, not sell, but give away their little watchtower magazines. And I know enough about Jehovah's Witnesses from my experiences over the years to know that they have no interest in Christmas and there's no way they're going to be a part of our interview. But it's kind of one of those socially awkward situations where you're walking down the sidewalk and they've seen you talk to like three people that walk by them. So if you don't talk to them, it's kind of weird. And, you know, it's, it's like ghosting them, pretending like they're not there. So I'm not going to do that. That's not the nice thing to do. So here I come with my ridiculous Santa Claus hat on and my church member with the sparkling elf ears and our camera crew. And we walk up and they're standing there and they're Jehovah's Witness. I'm like, hey, how are you guys? So we're doing it. I start into my spiel. I get like five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds into it. And they're like, we have no interest in being on your video. Do you know that Christmas is a pagan holiday? And, da -da -da, they, start, ba -da -da -da, and they start going on. And I'm like, yep, I know that. Yeah, I know that. I wouldn't normally wear this. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> and they're giving me the full like Jehovah's Witness lecture on the pagan origins, pagan origins of Christmas and yada, yada, yada. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that too. I know that. So because I've spent a lot of time over the years sort of interacting with Jehovah's Witnesses, I've learned how to relate to these dear people and how not to relate to them. Once they sort of give their initial spiel about the pagan origins of Christmas, I say this to them, which is my go-to line when talking to a Jehovah's Witness. I say, hey, I just want to tell you guys, I'm so thankful for the work of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, let me tell you something. They never hear that. <laughs> Trust me on this. They never, ever have somebody come up and say, I'm so thankful for the work you guys are doing. That just doesn't happen. In fact, if you've spent much time around Jehovah's Witnesses, they're very combative. They're trained to be argumentative. They're trained to, to really stand. And frankly, they've been hugely persecuted. I have a magnet on my refrigerator that I got at the Holocaust Museum 
in Washington, D.C. that has Jehovah's Witnesses on it because they were, they were rounded up as well with others uh, during the time of the Holocaust, and many of them lost their lives. I mean, it's a, these are people that have been persecuted, and frankly, they're pretty good at the conscientious objector thing too. Like, we have some commonalities with them, and what I tell them is, I'm so thankful for the work of Jehovah's Witnesses, to which they invariably say, after they've searched around and found their jaw, put it back on their mouth, they're like, why? And I'm like, well, there I became interested in Jesus through the visit of two Jehovah's Witnesses to my home. This is a true story. I became a follower of Jesus in 1996 at the age of almost 24. And two years before, when I was a purple-haired punk rocker, I had what many of you have had, the Jehovah's Witnesses came and knocked on my door. And this was at a time in my life where I was open somewhat to religious things. And these two young men came to my door and uh, they were friendly. They were nice. They were polite. They were my age. And so we just started chatting. We just started chatting. And I asked them a ton of questions about Jesus, about the Bible, about God. And they gave, frankly, some good answers. Some of the stuff they said was exactly true. I would later learn it was correct. The stuff they told me was, and it planted a seed in my mind about the legitimacy of a belief in God and of the, of the truth of Scripture, and I didn't become a Jehovah's Witness, and it was still two years future for me to become a follower of Jesus, but it absolutely planted a seed in my mind. And I tell these Jehovah's Witnesses this, so I'm standing there with my ridiculous hat on, and I say, those young men were helpful, respectful, kind, and passionate. And so I just have, I say, I've done a lot of door knocking myself. And so I've got a lot of respect for those of you that go out there. It's not easy to do standing out here. I just want you to know, I'm so thankful for the ministry and the work of you Jehovah's Witnesses. And they are completely flat-footed. They don't know what to say or what to do because nobody talks to them this way. People get into arguments with them or they're unkind or they're cruel or they're dismissive. Now, what I don't do is linger in these conversations because what I've learned is if you spend enough time in and around Jehovah's Witnesses, you will get into an argument because they'll try to bait you into it. I'm not being mean here. This has just been my experience on dozens of cases. So I try to keep these interactions fairly short. And so after they said they wouldn't be a part of our video, and I tell them a little story about how I became a follower of Jesus, and I just say, hey, I'm so thankful for those two young men knocking on my door. It was a real game changer in my life. I was a purple-haired punk rocker, and now I'm a committed follower of Jesus. And so as I'm walking away, this happens, this happens several times, as I'm walking away, they're like, uh, but, but why didn't you become a Jehovah's Witness? <laughs> See, I know that's coming. And then as I'm walking away with my ridiculous hat on, I'm like, well, I actually became a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, but I love the work you guys are doing. Keep up the good work. And I just keep walking. And I've left them with a positive interaction. With a, I've told them I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And I have had numerous experiences where, not in this particular case because I was just walking by, but where I've had Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door. And when I've treated them with kindness and respect. In fact, look what I put up here on the screen for you. When I affirm and appreciate, so I preemptively disarm any potential hostility and combativeness. Steve, you going to give me that slide up there or what? There it is. Affirm and appreciate so you preemptively disarm any potential hostility and combativeness. I've had Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door and then I've actually had Jehovah's Witnesses come back to me at a later time and actually engage me. These are new converts, new people to their faith and say, hey, could I ask you a couple questions about what you said last week? Fascinating. Now we're on a term of mutuality. Now we're interacting differently than the traditional sort of arguments that they're accustomed to. And so, one of my favorite lines when I speak to Jehovah's Witnesses, <coughs> after I tell them that I'm thankful for their ministry, I say, hey, just so you know, I too am a witness for Jehovah. And they're like, I have a similar line when I meet Mormons. I'm like, hey, listen, I'm a Latter-day Saint as well. Is that true? Am I, am I a Latter-day Saint? Yeah, I'm a Latter-day Saint. And they're always like, really? I'm like, yeah, totally. I'm a committed Latter-day Saint. They're just like, hey, when I meet Baptists, I'm like, I'm a Baptist. I believe in baptism by immersion. When I meet my Pentecostal friends, I say, hey, listen, I believe in the Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I mean, how much more do I have to say here to communicate that you try to build bridges, you maximize similarity? Are you with me? I'm not being disingenuous or uncomfortable. No way. I'm being very upright, very forthright with them. Now, let me tell you the story of Saperna. 
So I run a school, as some of you might know, we founded the school years ago called Arise. And Arise, we take anybody that comes, we've, had, we've trained many hundreds, thousands of people now over the years, but most of the people that come are young adults. And about three years ago, we had a young adult that came to our program named Akil. And Akil is Indian. And he was raised in a moderately conservative Hindu home, but he had become a follower of Jesus at the age of about 21, 22. And then he came to a rise and became a Bible worker. And now he's an on fire, spirit filled, amazing young man. I cannot say enough good about this guy. He's incredible. I mean, he is so bold for Jesus. He said to me recently, he said, Hey, David, this church that I'm working in right now is kind of drying up the Bible work situation. Um, if you want to hire me at your church, I guarantee you I'll have 10 baptisms in a year. There's very few Bible workers that have the boldness to just be totally reliant on God to say, we'll baptize 10 people through my ministry this year. I was like, how soon can you get here? I love the guy. He ended up having his contract extended down in Canberra. But the point is, he'd become a follower of Jesus and he'd come to a rise and he was really zealous and on fire, but his mom was, was still Hindu and dad and they'd had a divorce and now mom had remarried. And Akil comes to me one day and says, hey, David, my mom is coming up to visit up to where I was living. She's from down in Sydney, what they call the big smoke. That's what the Australians call a big town, the big smoke. And uh, mom's coming up from the big smoke and she's going to be around and she'd love to cook a meal. Would you like to come? I'd love for you to meet my mom. So I'm like, yes and yes, right? Because Indian food is the best food in the world. So I'm like, yes, I'm coming home cooked Indian food. I'll be there. And so the day comes and it's me and my wife and our two boys and Akil and a good friend, Robbie Morgan. Who else was there, babe? Um, obviously, Akil was there, her mom. I'm forgetting there was a, a girl there. Whose girlfriend? Oh, Akil's girlfriend, of course. So it's this is nice little gathering. She makes this incredible food. And I know that Saperna's a little, I, I, I imagine that she's a little suspicious about me because number one, her Hindu son has become a Christian and he attributes a lot of the reason that he became a Christian and a devout, evangelistically passionate Christian to me. And so I'm meeting her now and I'm prepared for the fact that there could be some hostility there, right? Like I'm, I'm ready for this to be, you know, like, a, what did you do to my boy? And I'm just ready for that. But when I meet her, she's incredible. First of all, she has her PhD in counseling and she's a clinical psychologist. She's a lecturer at one of the big universities there in Sydney. I mean, she, and she's beautiful. She's incredible. And uh, we just, she makes this amazing meal. The food is phenomenal. And uh, after the meal, we're just sort of sitting down and we're chatting. And in the course of the conversation, I use one of my go-to lines when I'm interacting with people that I don't know a lot about their worldview. And that's this. I say to Saperna, I say, Saperna, you know, the small talk is done. We're an hour and a half into the, you know, the, the time together. And I say, Saperna, I know that Akil was raised a Hindu and that you are a practicing Hindu or have been. Can you help me to better understand what you believe? Now, I know this might be hard for some of you to believe, but I'm actually really good at listening. I'm pretty good at talking too, but I, I love people and I love to listen to people. And so when I asked this question, I then did the socially responsible thing and the Christian thing. I actually, with attentiveness and interest, I listened to what she had to say. You, you know, there's a lot of well-meaning Christian people who they ask a question, but they only ask a question so that it can be their turn. You know, when you're done, and now it's my turn to talk. You know, and, and you have that sort of like, you're not listening, you're just waiting for me to pause long enough to take a breath so that you can jump in. No, 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 that's not active listening, it's not good listening, and it's not socially responsible behavior. I said, Saperna, help me to better understand what it is that you believe. Now, what ends up transpiring is this incredible conversation that lasts almost three hours, where we talk about the nature of reality and the nature of God and what it was like to be raised in a Hindu situation. And in the course of that conversation, she starts disclosing how her divorce was very difficult for her, how that made it difficult for her to raise a keel. And she would say things about Hinduism in which she would position herself. I could tell, I was picking up. She was positioning herself not as a devout advocate of Hinduism, but she would say things like, well, Hinduism teaches. And I was raised to believe. 
but she's a very educated woman who lives in a very secular city. And I can tell that she is subtly distancing herself in terms of being totally devoted to Hinduism. And so then she would say things like, that's why it's been so interesting to see Akhil become a Christian. And, and we have this incredible conversation. At one point in the conversation, she begins to cry as she tells me about her divorce. And you only cry in front of people you trust. Are you with me? Okay. I then go to one of my favorite tools, and this is a tool you'll want to put in your toolbox. You want this tool in your toolbox. When you're interacting with somebody with an unfamiliar worldview to you, use this question. It's fantastic. I say, Saperna, can you help me to understand from a Hindu perspective, what do you see as the primary problem facing the world, and what is its solution? You see? You could ask that question of a Muslim, you could ask that question of an atheist, you could ask that question of a Hindu, you could ask that question of a Catholic. Well, in your view, what, what is the primary problem facing the world? If somebody were to ask me that question, I would have a ready-made answer. I'd be like, hallelujah, can't wait. But I'm not there primarily to evangelize or to catechize. I'm there to develop a relationship and even to listen. Are you with me? And so she says, well, and this is key, she says, well, you know, Hinduism teaches but she doesn't, I notice that she's not saying, I believe, and my conviction, so she has an almost academic, I'm sensing that she has an almost academic or cultural relationship with Hinduism, and she's dropped several little hints in the conversation that she's actually noticed some really nice changes in Akil, and she thinks that Christianity has been really good for him. So this is not the hostile meeting that I had anticipated. I, I could have really made a mess of it. I, I could have made a mess of this meeting, but God was with me. And at a conversationally appropriate time, I asked her this question. I said, Saperna, what do you know about Jesus and about Christianity? And she gave an answer, and she was very honest and candid in that answer. She said, well, a lot of what I've learned has come through Akil and his conversion. And I don't know a lot, but, but I, I know this and I know that, and I'm listening. I'm listening. So this is, an, this is a conversation between a, you know, two reasonable people, intelligent people, mutually respectful people, and as the conversation comes to a close, and you wouldn't always do this, but I just sensed that it was appropriate. I just sensed the Holy Spirit had been in the room, and I say to Saperna, I say, Saperna, can I pray with you? What do you think she says? She says, yes, and we pray together. We pray together. At the end of the night, at the end of the night, she says to me, David, if I ever hear that you are in the Sydney area and you are not sleeping in my house or eating my food, I'm going to be very offended and upset. <laughs> Question, is that a success? Yeah, now, I don't know where we're on the continuum there, but maybe we've gone from a 4 to a 4.5 in one three-hour conversation. Now, again, Pastor Cano can't measure that, but the Holy Spirit can. That is success. And that's not the time to come in with a hard sell about Christianity and about Adventism because her son is a Christian and I'm playing the long game with Saperna because I know the Holy Spirit has her on a trajectory and my job in that situation is to not make a mess of it and ruin it. So here's another tool to put in your toolbox. Use what I call the primary problem, primary solution tool to better understand an unfamiliar worldview. That's a great tool. Put that tool in your toolbox. Be comfortable not knowing everything. Amen? I know that's hard for Seventh-day Adventists, but be comfortable not knowing everything. Admit your ignorance about certain things and don't pigeonhole people. If I had pigeonholed Saperna, that conversation would have gone very different and it could have gone very poorly. Are we together? You enjoying story time with Uncle David? Yeah. All right, let me tell you another story. This is a story of my friend Kifa Muhammad, and I'll just give you sort of the short version of this. I had the privilege of ministering in Detroit, Michigan for seven years. And by privilege, I mean purgatory. Um, <clears throat> no, it was great. But I mean, Detroit, Michigan, seven years. Yeah. I'm from Wyoming. Did I mention that? 
I like to be where the buffalo roam and the antelope play and the trout streams are clear and filled with big, beautiful rainbow trout, not in urban, dilapidated Detroit. But I ended up there for seven years. My wife still hasn't forgiven me. And we had a great ministry. We had a great ministry there, great time. And uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but Detroit is the place where the largest Islamic population in the United States resides. Um, there's a town there, there's a lot of Muslim people, um, but there's a town there called Dearborn, Michigan. Has anybody here ever been to Dearborn, Michigan? Okay, so, uh, okay, you literally feel like you're in the Middle East. Am I telling the truth? There are places I could take you to Dearborn, Michigan. You could be blindfolded. I'd take your blindfold off and you would think you were in Yemen. I'm not kidding. The Islamic prayer call is played over the public address system in the city. There is 10 mosques to every one church and almost all of the writing on the billboards and the signs is in Arabic, right? It's just, it's just a, it's a, lots and lots and lots of Muslims. Well, in, I don't know if you knew this or not, but Middle Eastern food is the second best food in the world, second only to Indian food, okay? So I love Lebanese food and Yemenese food and just good Middle Eastern food, right? And so we would go to a lot of these Middle Eastern restaurants and we would meet the owners of the restaurant and they were universally Muslim, okay? And I had learned in the course of my interactions doing some things wrong, I'd learned that you can say some really powerful and providential things to Muslims that will immediately bring their guard down, okay? And so when these conversations would invariably come up in the course of getting to know people, we had a couple restaurants that we absolutely loved. We went to a lot. One was called Grape Leaves and the other was called Lashish. And uh, we'd go in there and we'd see these people and in our conversations, I would say to them, they would ask me if I was a Christian. Now you got to be careful. If you tell a Muslim you're a Christian, you're not saying what you think you're saying. Listen to me very carefully. It's a little bit like saying you're gay 30 years ago and saying you're gay today, right? You're, 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 you might think you're saying you're happy and cheerful. That's not what you're saying anymore, okay? If a Muslim asks you if you're a Christian and you say yes, let me tell you what you're saying. You're saying that the Pope is your representative, you're a Roman Catholic, and you completely support all United States foreign policy against Muslims. You support immodesty, and you hate Muslims, and you support the media's caricature of Muslims. That's what you're saying. Now, I know that's not what you're saying. If somebody, if a Muslim asks you if you're a Christian and you're tempted to say yes, what you think you're saying is, I'm a committed follower of Jesus. The problem is that's not what they're hearing, and we have to understand the fluidity of language. So what you think you're saying, so you might think, well, it's a denial of Jesus if I say I'm not a Christian. So what I've learned to say is, I'm an Adventist to which every Muslim I've ever met that I've had this conversation with has invariably said, what's that? <laughs> and then I get to say, well, I keep the biblical Sabbath. I do not defile my body with pork or other unclean foods. I don't drink alcohol or nicotine. I believe in the coming judgment. I give one-tenth of my offering, uh, one-tenth of my income to charity. And they're like, I say, I pray every day, most times, most days, three times a day. You know what they say? You're a better Muslim than I am. <laughs> I'm not making this up. That's what they say. They say, you're a better Muslim than I am, right? What I've done there is I have used language that makes sense to them. And I've not used language that's going to create misunderstanding unwittingly and unintentionally. I've had the privilege of getting to know and getting to minister, and, and I could spend time telling you some incredible stories of a ministry that was launched out of a rise called AII, the Adventist Interfaith Initiative, in which Adventist, excuse me, Arise graduates, a young man by the name of Sam Bonello and another man by the name of Rodney McCollum, started just going to mosques, just going to mosques and meeting the imams and having incredible conversations, getting invited to, to conventions and to situations. And I, I, I'm completely short, shortening this story, truncating this story. But believe me when I tell you that a series of relationships developed from Sam and Rodney, they got, it got to the point where Sam found himself in Yemen a young man, a convert to Adventism who I had the privilege of baptizing, who came to arise as a, as a, as a sort of a quasi-Catholic as an 18-year-old, and now four years, five years later, finds himself in Yemen, 
speaking to like 600 seminarians at one of the premier conservative Islamic institutions, telling the story of how he came to be a believer in the one true God, but the whole thing he's telling from an Adventist perspective. I'm telling you, God can open incredible doors to people if we learn how to speak a language that doesn't in any way compromise what we believe, but doesn't also unnecessarily arouse the combativeness of those that we're trying to get the gospel to. And I don't know how familiar you are with the work of the Hanif and the contextualization that's taking place in the Islamic world, but what we've learned... What we've learned is that it's unrealistic to expect Muslim people to become cultural Christians. But they can become followers of the one true God and they can become followers of Jesus as the Messiah if we learn how to couch the great truths of Scripture and of Adventism in language that's accessible to them. I don't care if somebody wants to wear a hijab. That doesn't bother me. I mean, you're wearing a baseball cap. Doesn't bother me. Are you with me? Because there's no prohibition against the hijab. There's no prohibition to certain cultural elements. But what we sometimes think is, how are we going to take 2 billion Muslims and make them get to church on Saturday morning and sing Onward Christian Soldiers while sitting on pews? It's not going to happen. And the good news is it doesn't have to happen. Because God didn't say, go make Westerners of everybody. God said, go make disciples. And discipleship can look different in Fiji. It can look different in Saudi Arabia. It can look different in the Central Valley of California. It can look different in Australia because the point is for people to become followers of Jesus. And that can take on, amen, that can take on cultural manifestations that are fine. We've all seen the beautiful Filipino dress. They wear these beautiful barangs. And, and the, the, when I go to eat at a Filipino potluck, it's like, in fact, I'll tell you a really quick story. Not a Filipino potluck, but we got invited to a Samoan potluck. Okay, this is when we were in Melbourne and people were like, you've got to go to the Samoan potluck. You're going to love it. It's incredible. I was like, okay, yeah, we'll go. So we got invited to the Samoan, po Samoan potluck there. At, at, I, I, said, I think I said Melbourne. This was in Adelaide. Big camp meeting there. And it's so funny. So I don't know, you, you don't, don't probably get a lot of access to Samoan people, but they are some of the most beautiful people and they are huge, okay? They're like, you know, six foot four, six foot five, giant, you know, legs weigh more than me, huge big people. I'll never forget one of the first Samoans I ever met was like the size of three David Asherick's and he was wearing a shirt that said, real men wear skirts. <laughs> I was like, I agree. I totally agree. Mine is in the wash. So I had to wear these feminine pants, right? So the Samoan people, incredible people. We got invited to the Samoan potluck. And because I was the guest of honor, because I was the speaker there for camp meeting, we go into this room and there's a table the size of this stage, right? They've pushed like 10 tables together, just giant table. And there's like a hundred dishes. That's not an exaggeration on this, on this, uh, um, table. And they've got them all, you know, covered. And they start taking the, you know, the cloths off and the napkins off and getting all ready. They pray this big, beautiful prayer. There's, you know, like 150 Samoan people there, beautiful people. And um, they say, hey, you're the guest of honor. Can, can you, you know, you go first. So it's me and Violetta. And Violetta is like a generational vegetarian. Like she's a vegetarian. Her parents were vegetarians. Her parents' parents were vegetarian. She's like, I remember one time I took Violetta out on a date, first one of our early dates at a Thai restaurant. The people next to us were eating shrimp. And they were eating like the shrimp with like the, like the big shrimp with like the tails. Like, like, and, and Violetta leans over to me. She's like, look at that. I'm like, I'm like, what? What? She's like, look at what they're eating. I'm like, what? What? She's like, they have tails. You know, she's like, she's like, fully vegetarian, right? Like she doesn't even, you know, think of meat as food in any way, shape, or form. So we're at this, we're at this like Samoan potluck and they're like, you guys go first. And we're like, yeah, no problem. We get our plates and say, we start walking around, got some white rice, got a boiled banana. What else did we get, babe? I think we sat down. I think we sat down. 
And uh, all the, the, you know, these big, beautiful Samoan people are like, oh, bro, are you done now? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're, oh, why don't you get some food? There's some good fish and you, oh, bro, you're not going to eat just a banana and some rice, bro. I'm like, no, 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 we're vegetarian. It's all good. They're like, are you sure? It's got some good food here. And so I said, no, that's us. And then they're like, then they just descend, right? And the, they just pile up because they're big people. And they love their fish and their meat. And, and it was just a total cultural, it was just a whole new way of doing reality. I got no problem with that. I, I, I don't feel a compulsion to go into a culture, into a situation and say, hey, all you people have to look and eat and act like me. Right? Are you with me? Now, now, now I'm hopeful that people will learn and abide by various and sundry biblical principles. But friends, being a follower of Jesus does not have to look exactly like it looks in your situation, in your setting, in your culture, and in your context. Amen? Amen? Okay. Let me give you a couple more stories here because I'm running out of time. Are you bored yet? Because I'm I'm like waxing eloquent up here. I'm just going long. Um, All right, you can hear, I got time for one more story. What do you want to hear? The story of Joel, the story of Brennan, the story of Kate? I'll tell you the story of Kate. I'll tell you the story of Kate. Well, I'll quickly tell you the story of Joel. The very short version of Joel. Joel was a genuine atheist person whose mom drug him to one of my evangelistic meetings. You know how moms do. This guy's really smart. He's smarter than you. And and you think you know so much about how God doesn't exist. Well, you need to come because he'll set you straight, right? Like they build me up. Like I'm some, you know, amazing intellectual guru. So Joel comes in who was extremely intelligent and it got off to a messy start. Um... Uh, Let me just fast forward through a couple of these. I I already said that. Okay, so got off to a bit of a messy start, but then we hit our stride and we started having a really good conversation. And I said to Brendan, one of my favorite things, or not to Brendan, to Joel, one of my favorite things that I love to say to atheists, and that is this. Hey, listen, I want you to know that I am resonant with many of the intellectual motivations for atheism. And I am. I know the reason why many people are atheists. And some of those reasons involve the fact that the religion that they've been exposed to and the version of God that they've been exposed to, now this is key, is a version of God that I also don't believe in. Now I'm going to say something that might go over some of your heads, but I'm going to say it anyway. Yahweh, the one true God of heaven and earth, is not threatened when people don't believe in the God that he isn't. Let me put a name on that. Yahweh isn't threatened when people roundly and emphatically declare, I don't believe in Zeus. Yahweh doesn't get all insecure and be like, what? They don't believe in Zeus? Well, I'm really upset now. No, 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 no. When people tell you they don't believe in God, there's a very, very, very high chance that you also do not believe in the God or gods that they don't believe in, there's a similarly high chance that they've never even had exposure to the special, amazing God that you do believe in. So don't go immediately on the defensive and feel like you have to come to the defense of some God that you yourself would reject. And so I say to Joel, Joel, listen, I want you to know I am deeply resonant with many of the intellectual motivations for atheism, including but not limited to the idea that God allows sinners to suffer eternal conscious torment in the fires of hell. I think it's ridiculous and stupid and I don't believe it. I also struggle, Joel, and I want you to know this, with the fact that there is so much suffering in the world and not just so much suffering, but the quality of suffering, the depths of suffering has been a real challenge to me in my faith journey. And I want you to know, I wrote a book about it and when the book was finished. I titled the book God in Pain. I had at least as many questions at the end of the book as I did at the beginning. So I want you to know, I get it. This is a dark world. And while there are many beautiful things in the world, I want you to know I'm almost an atheist. I say that to them. You're like, whoa, this just got super freaky. What do I mean when I say I'm almost an atheist? Well, I say, Joel, listen, you disbelieve in the existence of all gods. I'm very similar. I disbelieve in the existence of all gods except one. You with me? Because the vast majority of gods that have been manufactured and created and worshipped down through human history are not good news. They're terrible. 
And I don't believe in those gods. In fact, God was so adamant about some of these gods and their requests that he told the, the Israelites when they went into Canaan, if you find places where these gods were worshipped, destroy those places of worship because that is such a perverse caricature of who I am. God said these gods actually ask people to burn their children in fire as an act of devotion and sacrifice to them. And God says in Jeremiah chapter 19 verse 5, this idea of child sacrifice is so repulsive to me, so revolting to me, I want you to destroy those places where these heinous things have been done. Are you with me? So I get the fact that the vast majority of gods do not deserve to be believed in. When you start having a conversation like that, then I love to tell this story. I say, hey, listen, I recently watched a debate um, between a Christian and an atheist. The Christian was Dinesh D'Souza, and the atheist was the late Christopher Hitchens. And I tell them, I told Joel, and I tell atheists, I say, look, I was pulling big time for the atheist. I'm telling you the truth. Because in that particular debate that I watched between Dinesh D'Souza and Christopher Hitchens, Dinesh D'Souza was trying to defend the evolutionary hypothesis and how God worked through evolution. He was trying to defend the record of the medieval church in the dark ages, and he was trying to defend eternal conscious torment. Well, I'm not going to defend any one of those things, and fortunately for me, my church and my Christian dogma doesn't require me to believe any of that garbage. And so when the atheist started sticking it to Dinesh D'Souza about the ridiculousness of his beliefs, I was like, go get them. Go get them. I wished I had been in that debate. Not because I'm an intellectual match for Christopher Hitchens. I am no such match for him, the, the late Christopher Hitchens. But I would have loved to have been in that debate because after Christopher Hitchens' opening little salvo against God and his three points of critique were, again, God working through the evolutionary process, uh, eternal conscious torment, and the, medieval, uh, the record of the medieval church in the Dark Ages, I would have stood up and said, I completely agree with everything that Dr. Hitchens just said. And I would have sat back down. Now what's happening? We're not having a debate anymore because I also don't believe in the God that you don't believe in. Are you with me on this? Yeah. Incredible. So that's my story about Joel the Genuine Atheist. With some groups, this is very important, with some groups of people, here's another tool to put in your toolbox. Emphasizing Adventism's peculiarity will actually be a strength and not a hang-up. Remember, we maximized similarity with Ben, the Baptist chaplain, but what I'm going to do with the intellectual atheist is I'm going to distance myself from mainstream Christianity because mainstream Christianity teaches things that I don't believe. You with me? When I'm talking to a Muslim, I didn't maximize similarity with evangelicalism. I actually distanced myself from evangelicalism and I said I'm an Adventist and then I have the opportunity to define what Adventism means. Remember, I don't eat pork and I don't drink alcohol and I believe in the coming judgment, etc. So notice what I'm doing. I'm doing what Paul describes, I'm trying to do what Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Depending on the situation, the culture, the context, and the person, I modulate what I'm saying in situationally, culturally, and conversationally appropriate ways so that I can get access to their, to their minds and I can talk to them about how awesome Jesus is and the love of God. Amen? Amen? And at no point, I want you to hear me on this, I am not I, I, listen, I was on the debate team. I was a, an extremely successful high school debater. I was on the debate team. We traveled. We, we, were, we crushed it, okay? I love a good argument, okay? I love it a little too much. So you're not looking at somebody here who's afraid, who's milk toast, who's compromising. Oh, I don't want them to know what I actually believe. That's not me. I am roundly persuaded about the truths of Scripture, but I'm also trying to be smart and I'm trying to be like Paul, and I'm trying to be like Jesus, and I'm trying to learn what are the hills that I'm willing to die on, and what are the things I don't really care about. And the stuff that I'm increasingly not really caring about is the cultural trappings of Christianity, the cultural trappings of Adventism. What I'm committed to is what Scripture actually says. You with me? Okay. I think that's all the time we have stories for here. Yeah, I know, I know. Listen, I, you guys are very kind, but I've been blabbing on for like 80 minutes. Okay, 80, that's a long time. You're too kind. You're far too kind. You're far too kind. You're far too kind. Um, 
I, 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 the, okay, very quickly. I mean, like, okay, this is gonna be the two minute version. The first time I ever preached a meeting in New Zealand was in someone's living room. I, uh, the second time, because I had gone to and preach in a church in Blenheim and the pastor said, hey, we're going to go down to this town called Kaikoura and we're going to preach there. And I said, oh, is there a church in Kaikoura? They said, no, there's not a church in Kaikoura. You're going to be preaching in the living room of Kate and Adrian Claridge. And I was like, who? And they're like, he's like, well, they're not yet Adventists, but they've been watching three of and I installed a dish on their house like six months ago and they're going to have a bunch of their church friends there. I'm like, oh, who's Kate? Oh, she's the local Pentecostal minister. I'm like, whoa little beautiful seaside town there. If you've ever been to the west coast or the east coast of New Zealand, incredible place. If you're ever headed that way, let me know and you can look up Kate and Adrian. They're two of the best human beings I've ever met. So I go into their house and I preach in their living room to like 35 people that are their friends and church members from their, uh, you know, circle of influence and of faith. None of these people are Seventh-day Adventists, not one. Not one of them are. Um, that t- climber, that t- cl- clock is doing all kinds of things. I need my original clock time back if you could do that for me. I got, I got two minutes left. Long story short, what ends up happening is I, I, I preach a message on the Word of God and why I believe the Word of God, establishing commonality with people who were not Seventh-day Adventists, right? It was great. And then we just like, they moved all the couches. And then when it was done, we moved the couches back and we ate a really lovely meal together. And Kate and Adrian said, man, we've been watching you on 3ABN. We've been watching, well, I loved it. They were so cute. They said, we've been watching the Advent Truth. And I just thought, oh, I like that. Uh, we, we've been loving the Advent truth on 3, 3 ABN. We love the Advent truth. And then they said, hey, look, we're going to be in Wyoming. Is that my new time? Yes. Can somebody in the back confirm that that's my new time? Hey, is that my new time? You can have 15 minutes. If you okay, want. perfect. Thanks. All right. You get this story. <laughs> Only because you asked for it. Um, so, so... Kate and Adrian come up to me and they're like, hey, listen, we're going to be in the United States later this year. Um, We're going to be like on a two month road trip. We'd love to meet up with you. So I'm like, bro, that would be incredible. When are you going to be here? I've just met these people. And uh, Kate's incredible. She's a Pentecostal minister. She was like a world-class triathlete, competed in the world championships. Uh, Adrian's this big, fun, amazing local Kiwi guy who was a commercial fisherman. I just fall in love with them immediately. I just love these people. I love people in general. And these were easy to love people. If I get to heaven and I'm like, yeah, but Jesus, I loved Kate and Adrian. He's going to say, big deal. They were easy to love. What about those other, you know, knuckleheads? I'm working on them. So I'm in Kate and Adrian's house and they're like, hey, look, we're going to be in the United States later this year. We'd love to meet up. So we look at their schedule. We look at my schedule. I'm like, whoa, we're going to be in Wyoming, which is, I think I mentioned, I was born in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I was born again in Laramie, Wyoming. It's where the Buffalo Rome and the Antelope play, if I mentioned that. If I mentioned that that's where I'm from, if I mentioned I'm going to be there on a backpacking trip in about two weeks' time. Anyway, I love Wyoming. Special place in my heart. I actually wrote a song about it. I'm not going to sing it for you. So I'm like, I'm going to be in Wyoming, and they're like, well, we'd love to meet you there in Wyoming. So they say, yeah, we'll be in touch. It's like five months away. I've, I make invitations to people a lot. Yeah, come visit us in Australia, whatever, and people almost never take me up on it. But I get this call from Kate and Adrian. They're like, hey, look, what airport do we fly into? We're going to rent a car. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, well, this is actually happening. These people that I've just met preached in their home. They've watched me a few times on 3 ABN. I'm going to just hang out with them for two weeks in Wyoming and we're going to do a bunch of fishing and hiking and camping and backpacking. It's going to be great. So I'm going to be there with Nathan Renner. Does anybody hear who Nathan is? Great guy. Love him. So Nathan, by the way, if you didn't know this story, is the first person I ever gave Bible studies to. He was a punk rocker. I was a punk rocker. I became a follower of Jesus. I gave Bible studies to him. He became a follower of Jesus and we've been in ministry together basically ever since. We founded Arise together in 2003. It's a great story. So I, I have to kind of break this to Nathan. I'm like, yeah, Nathan, um, about that fishing trip, um, I, 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 I might have invited somebody to come along. Uh, and he's like, oh, are they fishermen? I'm like, nah, yeah, he's a commercial fisherman. He's caught great white sharks. Uh, he's not a trout fisherman. Uh, he's like, oh, who are they, friends? I'm like, well, I, I don't really know them. Uh, he's like, where are they going to stay? Well, they're going to be camping next to us. He's like you are insane. I'm like, I know. I don't, I can't explain it. Just, just felt good about it. I just had a feeling about it. Well, anyway, Kate and Adrian show up and as, as Providence would have it, God is so good. We're on the North Platte River and we fly fishing the North Platte River and I love fly fishing the North Platte River. 
and we, you float down in a little boat. We had a drift boat, and normally I'm rowing and Nathan's fishing or Nathan's rowing and I'm fishing, but come to find out, Adrian, as a little boy, used to row around the bays of New Zealand on the North Island, and his favorite thing to do in the world is to row a boat. I'm like, God sent you here. So he spends, I kid you not, I'm not making this up. He spends more than a week. Am I exaggerating this story? This is the truth, isn't it, babe? So we spend like a week to 10 days rowing around the, you know, the rivers of Wyoming and Adrian's just having the time of his life. And, we're, and Nathan gets to fish in the front of the boat and I get to fish in the back of the boat. We're having the time of our lives. It's incredible. So as we're floating down these rivers and Kate's back at the camp reading, she just set up her little hammock and she's reading and having a great time. She had no interest in being on the river fishing. We're in, you know, in the beautiful country of Wyoming, if you've spent any time there. It's just, it's just spectacular. And so Adrian starts sort of canvassing us on these floats. He'd be like, hey, you know, um, my wife's a, you know, she's a Pentecostal. She's a pastor. She's got some things she wants to talk to you about. I'm like, oh, it's going to be great. Can't wait to talk to her. And he's like, yeah, no, she's really full on. And she's got some stuff she wants to share with you guys. And I'm like, it's going to be great. I can't wait. And he's like, no, I don't think you understand. <laughs> So on like the third night or the fourth night, um, or the fourth, third or fourth day, Kate comes over and says, hey, listen, um, David and Nathan, because she just met Nathan, right? I've introduced them. And it's all working out swimmingly well. I mean, they're great people. They're easy to get along with. We're having the time of our lives. Adrian's rowing us around. It's incredible. So Kate runs like this incredible seafood restaurant in Kaikoura, New Zealand. She's an amazing cook. And so she comes up and says, hey, listen, I'd like to have you guys over to my campsite tonight and cook you dinner. And there's some things I'd like to share with you. And so we get on the river that day. We're like, yeah, 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 great, perfect. We get on the river that day and Adrian's like, I told you, I told you, it's coming, it's coming tonight. <laughs> and so we row down the river, catch a bunch of fish. That night we go back, get cleaned up and we go to her campsite and the sun is just beginning to set. It's that beautiful color in the sky. It's like going from sort of blue into that pastel pink into that red orange that you get like in the southwest, you know, of Colorado and Arizona and Wyoming. You get these incredible sunsets. And she's got this little picnic table. We're just camped by ourselves there along the North Platte River. Just uh, Nathan, myself, another pastor friend of ours and, uh, named Scott Moore and the, the Claridges. And she's set up this little table. She's got like little flowers that she's gone and found, little wildflowers and wrapped them up, made little place settings, and she cooks this incredible meal. I mean, it's just like, wow, this woman's a 10 out of 10. And so after the meal, sun is just a little, you know, evening glow in the sky. We've got a little lantern there on the table, and, and Kate's like, there's some things I'd like to share with you. Let me just say that we have enjoyed learning the Advent truth. That's what she calls it. It's so cute, so endearing. She's like, we have so enjoyed learning the Advent truth. We are keeping Sabbath now. And we, this has been, 3 ABN has been transformational for us. We, we feel like we know you already. And this time has been incredible. But I do feel like there are some things that, some things that I could contribute. You've added so much value to my Christian walk. I'd like to add a little value to your Christian walk. And I'm like, let's do it. Let, add some value. Let's go. And so she starts to talk about, what do you think? The outpouring of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues. And she gives like an hour-long Bible study on the gift of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, and speaking in tongues. Now, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but trust me when I tell, say, tell you this. I just listened. <laughs> I know. Miracle. <laughs> I just listened and she's talking and I'm doing the act of listening. I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, oh yeah, okay, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Nathan's there. I'm there. Were you there, babe? Yeah, you, Violetta was there. We're all just sitting there. Beautiful lantern glow, great meal in our bellies, the stars, the, the stars in the Wyoming sky. Can you tell I'm a little homesick? I mean, it's just like, whoo! So she finishes this hour-long Bible study. It was sincere. It was it was textual, it was honest, it was real. And the punchline of her study was, listen, the Sabbath has been incredible. The things I've learned about the resurrection and the state of the dead have been incredible. You have added value to my Christian walk. And I'm sharing some of those things with my parishioners. I wanna add value now to your journey with tongues and with the gifts of the Spirit and with prophecy. And Adrian, 
who, who, by the way, I should say, pause. Adrian, when we're on the river floating down, he's like, I'm not into all that. I find that stuff really weird. I don't like it. My wife's super into it. But let me tell you, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. And so I'm like, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And he's just like, no, you have no idea. You're going to get it. So unpause. Adrian's just sitting there and he's just like sweat. You know, he's just like... Because he's, you know, he, he's having a great time in Wyoming and he knows that the, as the Australians would say, the penny's about ready to drop. Like she's given this incredible Bible study there. Now, again, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, when Kate's done and there's this quiet hush in the air and it's a really, it's a moment. It's one of those moments, those, those moments in life you're going to always remember. I would have been like, Kate, thank you so much for that Bible study. Now, <laughs> I'm telling you. 15 years ago, they would have been driving off, you know, angry. And I would have, you know, I would have consoled myself that I told them the truth. You know what I'm talking about? No, 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 no. I'd got, I'd, I'd learned. I'd made so many mistakes. I'd learned how to ride the unicycle. And so when it's done, I say these words to Kate Claridge. I say, Kate, I want to start by emphasizing three points that we absolutely agree on. See what I did there? I start with points of commonality. Her Bible study had been excellent. She had identified many points about the importance of the Spirit, the lasting nature of the gifts of the Spirit, the ongoing uh, need for the outpouring of the Spirit. I mean, there was so much that I could agree on. And I said, Kate, let me just start with this. Here's three points that we absolutely agree on. And she just sat there very pleased, very satisfied. And, you know, she felt like she'd made some headway. And then I said, now, with your permission, I'd like to share with you a, f a few places where we might not see exactly eye to eye. Do you notice how I've couched that language there? We might, that's qualified, not see exactly, that's qualified, eye to eye, that's qualified. You see what I'm doing there? I'm, I'm establishing points of commonality. Hey, look, here's three things we definitely agree on. With your permission, I'd love to share with you my perspective on a few things that we might not see exactly eye to eye on. What do you think she said? She said, sure, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So I open up scripture and I share with her about a 40-minute Bible study from my perspective of what is happening with the gift of tongues in the New Testament. We went to Acts 2, we went to Acts 10, we went to Acts 19, we went to 1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 14 is where we spent the lion's share of our time. And I'm just walking her through these passages from my perspective, you know, affirming, and she's, yep, yeah, mm-hmm, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I'm just saying, so, you know, you would understand this like this, but I see this like this, and, and I know there are good Christian people who understand this verse this way, but I've always understood it. And we're just, and she's sitting there mostly quiet, but she's, she's taking it in, okay? She's taking it in, and she... When I come to the end of the Bible study, and Nathan, to his credit, said almost nothing because we didn't want it to look like we were tag teaming. When, this, when I was done, I'm telling you the, the God honest truth right now. And if Kate was here, she would tell you this story even better than I could say it. She's one of our, Kate and Adrian are two of our best friends in the world now. She would tell you the story even better than I'm telling it now. I finish my little Bible study, and Kate puts her head in her hands on the table just like this. And she says, why has no one shared this with me before? Amen. 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 And I was like, I think the Holy Spirit just did something really incredible. And Adrian's looking at me and we're like sharing this glance and Kate's just like this. And then she sits up and she said, it's a Pentecostal minister. She says, you've given me a lot to think about. I, it's late. Let's go to bed. Okay, great. So we go to sleep, have a little prayer together. The next morning, Kate walks over to my tent, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Sun's only been up for an hour. Good morning. I'm looking forward to getting on that river with Adrian. Kate walks over. She says, hey, um, can, I, can I share something with you? I said, yeah. She said, uh, can you call Nathan over? Yeah, Nathan comes over. She said, um, I came here with the intention to get you guys filled with the Spirit and to get you guys, you know, understanding the gift of tongues and the importance of, of the outpouring of the Pentecostal Spirit, all that. 
And she said, there's two books that have been absolutely formative in my journey. I teach people how to speak in tongues. It's what I do. It's what I've done for years. And she says, I threw those books in the campfire this morning. And she says, I went back over the passages that you shared with me last night. And she said, I don't know how I haven't seen what is so clear to me now. Thank you. You know what else happened? This amazingly godly, responsible woman, who, by the way, at this point is not a Seventh-day Adventist. Not even, she's not. She went back to her home church where she was the pastor one of the pastors on the pastoral staff, and she went back to all of the individuals that she had personally taught how to speak in tongues and gave them the Bible study that I had given her on what tongues is and isn't in the New Testament. Amen. About six months later, incredible. Six months later, she and Adrian came to Arise. Three months of incredible, right here in California, in fact, that's when it was here in, in, in Sonora came to Arise. At the end of that, they were baptized, and they are now spirit-filled, church planning, gospel preaching. It's incredible. Incredible. So, I want to tell you this. The last slide I want to put up here, the last slide I want to put up here just says this. Listen, 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 and then what? Speak. Speak. Hopefully, you've learned something in this seminar, how to build bridges, not walls. We don't compromise the content of what we believe, but we are willing to modulate the way that we communicate so that we can get access to people about the good news of Jesus Christ. I hope you've got some tools in your toolbox now that you can take out of here and that will be helpful for you. Don't forget that X to 10 fallacy. Moving anybody along the continuum is gospel success, and the Holy Spirit is working with everyone everywhere. Amen? Amen. All right. You guys have been extremely generous, extremely kind. Let me close with a short prayer. Father in heaven, I love these people, and more importantly, you love us. Father, our love for you is just a drop in the ocean of your love for us, and we want to thank you for being so awesome, so amazing. Help us to be the kinds of people that are responsibly and actively and enthusiastically taking the good news of Jesus Christ, His life, death, and resurrection to a world that's waiting to hear the good news is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen. God bless you all.